welcome everybody. Hey, Kiara, how are you doing? Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sven. Hey. Luke. Good to see everybody. Hi, Owen. How are you? Doing pretty well. So, um, I, I, as I said, I watched this morning because it's early for me. I listened in my car on my way to my gym class and the way back. So, I didn't catch all of it. <laughs> It's impossible to catch all of it. I think there is a lot of information going around at any time. So, and they yeah, have. I like messaging. I'm interested to see what you guys say. I, I basically was only able to keep um, to watch a few of the sessions, more around the the time management and the payroll, to see if anything new and groundbreaking had uh, started, but they only had the teaser for the next gen payroll, which was kind of disappointing. I was hoping that they'd show at least a little bit. I mean, we've been talking about this next gen uh, payroll, next gen payroll since what? Three years now. And it's like, okay, show us, show us at least. I think, at least. You know, I think the message is it's hard to improve upon perfection. <laughs> Well, I think they have <laughs> occasions on other events for partners, right, where they have demoed uh, a UK version of next gen payroll. So there's more than there's more than just uh, uh, fake screenshots behind it. Um, but yeah, we'll 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 see. And there's no date yet either. Right? Yeah, but, yeah but it would be nice just to sh just just a little bit, just a, a taste of it, you know. Mm -hmm. to kind of um, get us ready for the years to come. Yeah, I, I think, think they're afraid of going. You know that you should probably move to the UK. The UK has always been the plan, but this morning I actually heard that there was the UK and the US as a first two. That, US, those are both uh, two pilot countries they're doing. Yeah. US yeah. and UK. US, that's... That's a huge well, one, the US. Better than France. Or Germany. <laughs> Well, it covers a large, as, as soon as we start having the U.S. customers getting on it, and I think you will actually have a decent follow-up, we'll actually have uh, a, lot of, a lot of verification of how it compares to the current one. Yes. I would suspect there's some multinational companies based in the U.S. that they already have interest from, um, and mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons they're developing it for the U.S., but what did you hear about time management, Sarah? Anything startling there? No, they're starting to introduce a little bit more of what's happening with the time tracking. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm seeing a few things where we saw in the old on-premise, you know, we had a lot of issues over in, in Europe that shifts that start on Sunday night are actually a Monday shift. Right. And I said, can you assign it to the next day? And they said, nope. I said, okay, did we learn anything from the last solution? Yeah, that's been a known issue. Why is that? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I thought that it was um, it was a very good case in point, looking and stating that two the time management and the payroll are very tightly um, twinned. In our, in, yeah, you can't do one really with today without the other. There's so much attention on time management today. <coughs> Well, in some countries, I, you actually cannot legally touch payroll unless you have the Italy is one of those. I suspect France and Germany are others, although I don't know them as intimately. Not at all. Also with the European um, Court of Justice ruling that everybody is supposed to be um, clocking in and out in Europe. And right. we're expecting the, a lot of laws coming through in the individual countries in the near future. We were expecting a lot more, but. Well, yeah. I think that's one thing that's changed with the pandemic um, because you have all these people working at home and in some cases they're wondering, how are you tracking their time? Are they really just working their shift? Or are they working beyond that? And will there eventually be, you know, lawsuits or something, complaints about that among the employees? True. I think that it's an interesting case with the with the European court ruling because it's it's two years now, isn't it? And most of the EU countries are still basically ignoring it <laughs> or postponing it or discussing. I don't know, but so far, yeah, uh, until they get bombed. 
Yeah. Well, we've we've seen the first court cases in Germany yeah. where um, the employees have taken the uh, company to court and have won because of it. That they have to have the time tracking. So um, until then, and until the laws come through, and I know Germany's been trying to get new time laws through for probably the last 15, 20 years. Um, but um, they're they're all waiting for that because mm -hmm. they're saying, well, what if we implement and then they change the law and then we have to change everything again, which is why a lot of them are hesitating. But at the same time, they're looking at it and say, you know what, especially with COVID, they're saying, OK, we really need to modernize because our, our solution is, first of all, too old, doesn't let the employee really integrate as much as it as they need to you know like shift swapping and and stuff like that right. the, the modern tools and as you say it's the basis for a lot of the payrolls so well and when you think of of the covid situation and the need of many company to know who is where at a, at a given time we actually get on the topic of uh, if you clock in and out you know exactly who's in and you have proof and you may be able to act on it. If you don't know, um, if you don't have a clocking system and you have the core times that are open to everybody and you follow the shifts, you don't really know. So you cannot, uh, you're stuck to take, you're having to take present sheet and uh, marking who's present, who's not, uh, what kind of occupancy rate you have. And this has been lasting for now, what, two years almost? Yeah, time management's very complex. Yeah. So, I had a customer ask me the other day if it's possible to, um, if, if uh, clocks had a, p a camera in them so it could take a picture of the person clocking in to make sure it really was the person clocking in. I've heard about stuff like that or just GPS tracking to see if they were really on site when they clocked in. Geofencing, mm -hmm. yeah, which yeah, is. Yeah, but yeah. The, so the the photo big thing, brother. <laughs> the photo I, I thing that would kill a lot of people who, who uh, go over the law at the moment in Germany because it's so common, not necessarily the clocking in, but clocking out, right? Oh, I have to work more than 10 hours today. I don't want to fill in this sheet. Can you just take my badge and clock me out when you leave? It's so common in a lot of uh, companies in Germany. Otherwise, people really have to go downstairs, clock out and go back again. Well, that, that's even right. more time. So did anybody see the... Um... I don't know if it's an announcement really, but uh, there was talk of the um, S4 HANA timesheet solution, which is going to span S4 success factors and field glass in the, I believe in the keynote earlier today. Yeah, no, I new did not. Tell me. Place the CAT solution that's going to go across all of them. We don't have a timeline on that yet, um, but luckily, you know, the thing is, it's going to do the WBS elements and all of those things that the timesheet and EC is missing. Yeah, yeah. there's there's a so I, I actually uh, I had a had a brief session with SAP about it a uh, few weeks ago, and I saw some bits and pieces about what they're planning. And yeah, absolutely, Sarah, you're right. Um, it's it's going to be. Um, uh, it's not a replacement for time tracking, but it's going to sit along. It's going to sit in S4. It's going to be used for entering time. It can do a lot of the complex stuff, but there's a certain amount of functionality that if it doesn't go into time tracking, it will go into this new solution. As far as I'm aware, um, yeah, I can't actually say anything about actual details. I think so. Um, so it's possible. But it's in the something future. that's. Sorry, it, I mean it'd be two different systems, so people would have to enter potentially time in two different places. No, they um, just enter no? it in place. It, it should be like the CATS application that you would be able to replicate that data into the time management that you need to then complete the time management. Okay. I think but it was one of the... For other things as well. Okay. I think it was one of the excuses, or, or sorry, uh, of the reasons uh, why uh, the time tracking development came so late that they were looking for a an overarching solution where, where data can is not just in success factors but can flow into S4 and field class and you know what um, which we've seen in, in, in various areas that, that rather than developing something for one solution or a one-to-one -one, uh, integration 
uh, they go across the whole solution landscape and, and uh, make sure to share data as much as possible. Which makes sense. Uh, yes, it's, it does. It's a daunting task. For real. So right. what did you guys think about the, the big announcements? Opportunity the marketplace. marketplace, dynamic teams, you know, I think it actually goes quite well with the discussion we had with Stacy last week. It does. It does. I was like, oh my God, it's like, you know, we were psychic. We were talking about the same things. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's not about a great resignation or how many people are employed or how many are not employed. It's simply about, and Amy, I think Amy said something that was a very relevant to me. I, I reposted a few things on that. It's uh, that's a cultural shift. Yes. You know, when we start when we start this having the cloud coming on, suddenly the data ownership came down to the manager and to the employee. And that was a lot of information and a lot of change management that companies needed to do. But now this will actually give the ownership of the career, which ideally had always been with the employee but in many cases has not really been obvious but uh, with that it can actually go really there and that's uh, that's a huge shift a lot of education not only for the ownership of the career but also for to the managers you know yes i don't own you i think also there's a real lack of good people managers um and so to be able to put that in the hands of the the individual and a lot of their talk was about making it more individualized, right? To be able to put that in the hands of the individual is powerful. And I think that the individuals have already been in charge of their careers for years. Just not inside their own organization, right? Right. But if they are locked on LinkedIn, LinkedIn gives them growth opportunities, uh, whether it's a sidekick, whether it's learning, whether it's a completely new role. So I think HR only has the choice to compete with it or or be left with those who who don't really want to learn anything new. So I think it's a natural point. It's almost like an internal LinkedIn we are we are looking at and if you don't offer yeah. it then people spend most of their growth search outside the organization yeah that's what i was going to say is is what you're doing is empowering them to do it inside the organization yeah. instead of outside of the organization to hopefully retain those those talents because with the linkedin you see headhunters are going after our you know the, as fast as we can train up um skilled employees they're getting hired away uh, right because it, the market's more visible on what job opportunities there are out there. And I, you know, having to have hired a couple of people in the past year, I can tell you what a drain it is on productivity. Um, so you find the person, then onboard the person, and get that person up to speed. I mean, you you can easily lose a year's worth of productivity. Yeah. Between the manager and the person who's being onboarded, absolutely. The, the center of capability is particularly interesting because, you know, having come from a background, having um, worked with a lot of customers building out succession planning solutions and whatnot and, uh, and, and you know, working with the, the technical solutions, uh, particularly on premise in the past, you know, there was a strong um, focus on using qualifications, you know, which could, you know, could cover competencies or skills and whatnot. And having those on position so you can do a matching of candidates um, for successions, for recruiting, for, for all sorts. That's something I've really not seen in success factors um, in the, to the same level of, of detailed functionality that we have or had in the, uh, the on-premise solution. So I'm quite yeah. keen on, on, on the trajectory that this is, is going to go. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. But listen, I don't want to fill out ever again another skills profile. So I like this. <laughs> and I think that's one it reason why we handy to have it across all borders because we also used it, you know, for um, shift planning because you needed to know which qualifications you needed. Right. And so it, it just arched over everything and you don't have that at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And there's probably different purposes like we, you don't have to use that same solution across all different all employees but for certain uh, jobs like you're talking about sarah there certainly should 
be that capability. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things um, really the, rigid, yeah, so there's this really rigid skills planning uh, where you have compliance, like in the pharmaceutical industry, making sure that people have the yeah. right certificates and these yeah. things. And and this has always worked in the in the old solutions in some shape or form in in success factors. But it, with these rigid processes, they can't keep up with how quickly the the world is changing. Right. And, and there was always this this HR world where you think in org charts and and job descriptions which take uh, a year to change and then there was the real world where where work gets done where creativity happens and and i think the i hope that the the philosophy behind opportunity marketplace and this is is to like be more flexible and and use ai and so on to uh, get nearer to the real world really not uh, live in in a separate hr world yeah, um, one of the things that the lady from Zurich and I missed her name was uh, that spoke with um, Jill. I really liked what she said. It kind of touched on the conversation we had with Stacy last week, too. She said careers are a series of short stories now. And mm -hmm. really, that's what we're talking about. It's not we talked about like unless you're a doctor and you go to medical school and then you always stay a doctor careers when you enter a corporation business whatever they change so dramatically because of the technology and because the business world the economy is constantly changing so rapidly so i mean among us we've all done a lot of different things in our careers right oh yeah yeah even even though we all stayed in the hr technology area which seemed to be pretty <laughs> <laughs> we love it. We love it. That's yeah, all. different things radically. And even all of us in our own specific professional life, we've already done a number of different things. Okay. Luke has been a consultant, entrepreneur, and many other things. Sherry, case in point, um, Sarah, Sven, we all have done so many different things. Yeah. And they don't, and they, on one side, there are, is, to some extent, it goes with what Van was saying. There are the hard skills, and we all have a very similar set of hard skills, I suspect. But all the soft skills that go with that are radically different, which allows us to actually fulfill and fit in different areas, whether it is in a, in a, at a customer looking at strategy and driving and communicating that piece or it is communicating and influencing a whole range of people as you're doing now sherry and so on it's it's and that's where the difference really is because anybody can get a diploma of some kind right, that right, states right, and right. writes or cobol or abap so i mean i think great. luke was a writer in his previous life i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> i actually worked in the music industry before i was in the sap industry so See? There you go. I studied languages and literature. <laughs> very exactly. different things. So yeah, that's a very HR that always put uh, was able to pay the school bills. <laughs> <laughs> totally get that. <laughs> yeah. I guess we all have to develop in a way that uh, to monetize some kind of skills. And when the skills we have cannot be monetized that easily, we fall back <laughs> on something that. <laughs> well, actually, the languages came in really handy because when you think of it, um, set, um, programming a system or setting up a, a system language. is just taking your requirements, thinking those through, and then translating it into a way that the system understands it. So if you understand how to do languages, it it works very well for any system that you're going to work with. So totally agree. I mean, technology isn't what it used to be. I was a communications major and same thing. You know, I saw technology as a way to further communication in mm -hmm. different ways. Yeah, it is. It is. So what did you do, Sven, before you you landed in this beautiful HR tech area? I always say I, I never I never learned any decent profession, so that's why I have to be a consultant. <laughs> so well, you do after it well. university, during university, I had all kind of jobs. I gave horse riding lessons. I was writing for a local newspaper. I was working in construction. 
Uh, but then after university, it was uh, I just was a consultant all my life. You see, lots of skill learned uh, on on the uh, on the way that allows you to do be what you are now. Yeah. And, and the funny thing, I, I guess, in my in my horse riding career, I learned more for for the job than at university, especially project management. Um, as I yeah, I worked a lot as a volunteer for the regional organization. But yeah, here we go. <coughs> that makes sense. Should there, there's one topic I think on, on from Success Connect we haven't uh, touched yet, um, unless you still want to stick to the opportunity marketplace. No, but no. The topic is uh, is also work zone, right? I mean, it's yes. not that new, um, but I think it's really just hitting the road. Um, so if you, what are your thoughts about work zone? It's getting a very good acceptance. Yeah, and I some think words at HR tech conference, right? With HR executive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, so for me, from a customer point of view, who's always had been trying to bring the whole company together in one place and share information. When work zone first came out, that's what I saw it as a way to really share HR information with the rest of the organization and finance information with HR and kind of bring it together. That that might be a little bit of nirvana, but I think it has the possibility to get there. I think it has a, it gives. You know, if you look at the history of sorry, I'm a history nerd. If you look at SAP and its development, it used to be all self-contained in a database. Yes. yes. And the communication between the different pieces of the database, forget the fact that it was not very user-friendly, whether it was a gray on gray, blue on blue, or green on black. And some of us I still remember that. Black. Yes. yes. <laughs> but the different pieces were communicating internally. And you could go yes. from one area of, if you had the, uh, the appropriate permission, you could go from one area of, you could go for RP to RV to RF, pardon the language, <laughs> seamlessly. Right. But that was only if you knew the language. So what WorkZone does is dumb it down, like I like to say, for yeah. the average user. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Work zone does the same across multiple systems because you're not anymore because SAP has exploded and also technology has exploded in multiple different pieces and multiple different uh, technologies and supports. Both from the technological point of view and from the user friendliness and what work zone does is unify all that and bring it all in one place in one accessible location. So I get it's uh, it's it's a universal work list up to the up to day to day with a user experience that makes sense and uh, with an accessibility to much more. So yeah, I'm not surprised it gets an acceptance. I'm surprised it doesn't get more of an acceptance because it should be a starting a starting block. I think Luke, it's do you a know customers are any customers asking for it, Luke or Ben? A lot of uh, them are I'm not. Asked. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Luke. I was going. I was just going to say that I haven't really seen um, necessarily any customers asking for it, but I know the new customers, SAP, are recommending it, and it seems to be getting some um, some interest from from customers. But I've not really seen anything from existing customers at this stage. But you know, and we always track this, you know, like at the HR Global User Group to say, okay, when did something come out and when were the first um, adaptations of these, you know, um, solutions? And so it was like, okay, we found out that it's coming out. Okay, then they've got to say, we don't want to be the first ones because we don't like to be the guinea pigs. So then they wait till others get started. And then once it gets started and they see the value of it, they have to go through the process of getting the budget and all of that through. Right. So you're looking at, you know, typically like a two year window most of the time, especially with these global least, yeah. players before they start looking at them. And I think part of it is the need has to be there. And maybe, you know, this remote working has driven the need for that more to, for people to have things more at their fingertips in their own 
workplace and work time yeah. without relying on somebody else. I don't know. Yeah. It's, just, it's just another case of, of um, you didn't know you needed it before you had it in your hands. <laughs> right, right. Like television, right? Yeah. That was around for a long time before it really, you know, hit the market big time. Now I need it. <laughs> Did you know you needed this? <laughs> what is this? I've never seen uh, it. <laughs> the, the first ones were like little suitcases that you had yeah. to drag with you. And nobody wanted to drag the suitcase, <laughs> so they waited. And it was too expensive. So again, um, you know, the other thing you also see is um, when these solutions come out, they don't get implemented straight away because who knows how to implement it? True. And so that's another well, factor. Well. They, they could have been trained, but not really, you know, know it well. And I think it's probably a case where you also have to deeply understand your customer's business model across functionality to really use it well. Yeah, and, and think of how many in HR struggle as soon as they start talking to finance. And well, we know up to that border and about that much over it and the opposite way around finance is well we know up to there and about that much more of, of hr but nobody really knows all of the details um, right and, we've, and hr we've generally that. doesn't want to share details so more <laughs> finance <laughs> right yeah it's just a tug of war <laughs> go away don't want this to see <laughs> yeah but in terms of work zone i've had a lot of customers more asking about it rather than asking for it, right? There's yeah. interest. There are yeah. some customers who, who say, so basically what you are telling us that what we would have thought the, the homepage is going to do for us more and more in future, we now have to buy something new. Uh, so that's definitely one feedback, especially from like mid-sized organizations. Great. Um, but then others, they, they see the, the added value, but it's not, an, it's not an easy thing to deploy like an extra success factors module, right? It, mm -hmm. It's a lot of BTP you have to have behind it to really use it. And now there's a new bit of confusion, at least f for me. Um, I'm not sure how does Workzo now relate to SAP Mobile Start. Have, have you looked into that yet? No, I, I haven't. Have, Luke, have you seen anything on that? I have not. No. I've seen the headline, and that's about it. So, um, yeah, okay. one of on on my homework list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I saw quite. Sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Luke. So I saw, yeah I saw some quite interesting comments this morning on on Twitter about about work zone, um, mostly from Chris Payne. Um, a couple of things he he said that I thought were quite interesting was like there's quite a large overlap between success factors onboarding and what work zone can provide, yeah. and kind of you know which one would you leverage for what, or would you could you actually leverage work zone to do your onboarding instead of the onboarding solution? Um, of course, you know there's 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 a couple of things missing from that, you know like the the i9 integration in the US a state. Uh, federal tax or country level tax forms um, and all that kind of stuff but that was a that was an interesting comment and, and he did post a screen a screenshot as well um, oh, that is interesting i have to look for that yeah yeah i thought that was particularly interesting and then um one thing you also mentioned and i've been looking to see if this gets um maybe uh resolved i guess for lack of a better term in the in the in the keynotes for the americas event um that's coming up is you know chris basically said uh to to, to read it I, i'm not entirely sure i got from the success connect keynote the reason why a customer would pick up on work zone or why it won the hr tech award other than it is very flexible i'm not sure that's a compelling reason um, but it certainly seems people are it's excited need, about right? it right yeah so i'm kind of uh, I, I think i think they're fair comments um i'd like to know i'd like to know a bit more and there was some there was some chat um uh, on twitter um about that with somebody with chris and somebody from uh from sap um it's quite worth uh, uh i think anybody out there to to go and, and and read that that thread and actually check out chris's tweets because he's the about the only person i saw who was actually live tweeting about the event 
Okay, um, great. Today. Yeah. His Good Twitter job. handling is Wombling, W-O-M-B-L-I-N-G, right. for anybody that uh, isn't already following him. But you can find it even if you just search Chris Payne. Yeah. That too, hey, yes. <laughs> yeah, the other thing Amazing. I was thinking, thinking is, you know, kind of like the payroll control center. You know, when we saw that came out, that was probably about, what, five or six years ago. And, and not until ECP came out did we start really seeing the adoption of it because a lot of the companies, because they had the need, would get third party tools or build things of their own. And um, right. I've seen a lot of them using uh, service now to, to fill a lot of these gaps. Well, also and, I think uh, that has to, does it have something to do with the cloud, Sarah? Because I think a lot of customers weren't on the right version on premise to use it. Well, I think they had other tools because they had those needs for compliance for so many years. We did, yes. That they built those themselves or they used third party tools to do that compliance. And they're saying, well, you know, here to do it in another, uh, you know, with payroll control center where we'd have to build the rules again, um, why the other is Fair now enough. working. And so it's only when they go into ECP do they consume it because then they do it as part of their payroll rollout instead of trying to connect their old tools right. to the system. Right. So the so. investment on to add on to on premise isn't worth it. Yeah. Well, I found it funny that some people even still seem to think that PCC is part of ECP and they're not even aware that you can use it in, in purely on premise. And, and especially if you're on a core hybrid setup, I think it's got exactly the same value of saying, okay, your, most of your HR and payroll people can work completely inside the the success factors UI and, and yeah. from there go through PCC and so on. So I think the value is is the same. Or maybe I'm overlooking a small detail, but, but I don't see there's any big difference between using PPC in core, PCC in core hybrid versus in an ECP. Yeah. Context. Oh no, I agree with that. I think people just don't want to do the work of rewriting their audit reports that they've written. Yeah, rewriting the coding. Because we that. did, we 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 pushed this, we announced it, we showed it, you know, and stuff like that. But like we were saying, is like Sherry, you said they've done those audit reports themselves or or built it all themselves over the years, and they said, well, we're not changing now. And you have a limited amount of money to do something with your, you know, there's yeah. higher priorities. Yeah. 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 Or simply they prefer to see what, you know, anyway, we'll do a jump in a year or two or whatever. And in the meanwhile, it doesn't make any sense to invest in something we're yeah. going to retire shortly. We might as well just wait and have a little bit of patience. Quick question from my side. Was anything mentioned um, about, you know, the S4 HANA, um, HCM for S4 HANA, because that's supposed to be coming up 2022 with migration tools. And um, I haven't uh -huh. seen anything about that. Uh, there was a mention in the, there, there was a session on payroll vision and it yeah. was mentioning that piece. But it didn't. I didn't hear any reference to specific what tools, what not tools, or what uh, could be leveraged yeah. to use it. Then again, it's not supposed to be very different. The only thing you could potentially do is essentially simplify for the pleasure of the simplification. Yeah. But again, if you're going to tell them you're going, uh, if you don't have a way or a tool to to migrate that stuff and all that you're customizing, it's a new implementation. And yes. right. getting a business case to move it over is gonna be the exact same as the ones that are on premise and saying, I'm not moving to the cloud because I don't have a business case. Right. Yeah. And then some. Yeah, so a lot of them are saying, well, okay, well, we don't wanna to go to the cloud, but HCM for S4 HANA would be a you know, a solution to kind of extend the life after 2027, but we're waiting to see what's going to happen with these migration tools that SAP keeps promising, but we haven't seen any details on that. No, I, I haven't seen anything on all that. Uh, to be to be totally transparent, I don't really focus on that part of the solution. Yeah, because I don't like it. <laughs> well, I think it's a limited audience too. I think they believe well, it's a limited audience. It's, it's more than that, in fact, and I, I'm just joking here. In fact, 
because I simply have been in, on the global side, uh, you know, global payroll is always essentially a, a puzzle of different pieces rather than being something altogether. So I never really address that part. Uh, payroll and time management are always part that are handled by a much more local crowd than a global crowd. No, not always. Not always. Not always. You always need some pieces that are global across. Yeah, but even Nestle, for example, you know, they had their global team taking care of it because it was all in, in a system and they're going to say, well, we don't want to migrate country by country. How do we move that across now? Right. No, my lady. Even Nestle had at least two separate tracks because they couldn't be at the time put together in the same track. And the yeah. two separate track was already a consolidation of previous additional multiple track. And they were supported by a number of local uh, globe environments. So yes and no, there are some yes pieces no. that were always uh, aligned yeah. globally, but then much of it uh, for many companies, even people like the Nestle of the world, it was a tremendous piece of work to align further to make it truly global. Yeah. And now and, they're not going to want to go country by country to migrate yeah. it to an yeah. S4 HANA. Yeah. So. But well, I think what, I, what I would tell customers at the moment regarding H4, S4 is, um, a, if, if you've already started to do something on, on your ERP, um, you can be sure that it will be a much, much easier job because it's the same system. It's basically just the technical switch of the database, right? Um, so plan for this, but unless there's some compelling reasons, I wouldn't even worry about it now. Just wait until Q4 next year, it's here, and then look at it and then plan yeah. because why would you be the first one to do it for no change in functionality? No. But, but the, yeah, there will be some yeah. where there are reasons to try to be quick and then yeah, they might want to know about the migration tools earlier. Well, so and to clarify for our listeners who aren't as savvy as you guys, yeah. what we're talking about is a business, let me see if I got this right, a business that is moving their ERP on premise to S4 HANA. Yeah. And now they're like, okay, now I've got this HR system sitting on premise with SAP. What do I do with it? Right. And this is the piece that allows you to take your existing on premise HR and hook it temporarily for a limited amount of years to the S4 H4 system. S4 system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Having yeah. coexisting within the same H4 HANA platform. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, because the HCM for S4 HANA is not limited, right? It's got the same maintenance schedule. At, yeah, but that's the same for S4 in theory. So if right, S4 that's gets true. extended, that will be extended too. That's the idea. Yeah, so that's true. They've extended um, on premise now again? No, no. But okay. once so, you move yeah, to so HCM for S4 HANA, you are on the maintenance schedule of S4 HANA. Yeah, so, right. And that's 2040 at the moment. Yeah. Someone's considered another edition of yeah. Yeah. Most likely, but then again, even 2040 gives a decent horizon to see and to decide what you will do after. Yeah. Even if you count a few years before because you need the time to figure out what to do and what not to do and so on, to 2040, well, you have time till 35 anyway to think about and then to start taking decisions and action. So there is yeah, time the more... to see. There's time for that, but the more imperative date is 2027 yet, right? Is that right? right? So if yeah. you're on ERP on premise, you've got to do yeah. something with that whole mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. And that's the You'll need to take some decisions. worried about at the moment is saying, where do I go? Do I go to ECP? Do I go to S4 HANA? What are these migration tools? Do you know? Um, right. What's the strategy? And because they're saying, you know, it took us mm, 10 years to get this over and and consolidated yes it's going to be easier but it took them a lot of years and if you look at it we're 2020 almost 2022 now so that's going to leave them five years they've got to get the budget they've got to have the team they've got to know how to do it but you know the true answer is uh, unfortunately it's a classical consulting answer it depends, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
It does depend. I, I see some advantages to moving your HR platform first if you can get the funding for it, because I think um, I think Success Factors really has that model down of migrating from where you are and you're existing on premise to another platform. Um, I think you know HR knows what they're doing. And also then you have this great foundation because once you move, I suspect that once you move to Esperhana and have all these other neat capabilities, your HR system is going to look really archaic. If you're still on premise. Yeah. But unfortunately, some of the um, larger companies, they've done so many, quote, modifications to their solution that they can't go to the ECP. Not easily. <laughs> yeah, and, and we've discussed it with a few and say, well, let's try and see if we could simplify that, um, re reverse engineer some of this. And they're saying, no, we can't because this has been negotiated with Works Council and we can't take it right. out. We can't put it in the solution. And that's where they're saying, okay. Or, you know, a lot of the public sectors are also saying, we're not going to be able to move to a cloud solution quite as easy. And so they're trying to look at the S4 HANA's solutions and um, trying to figure out what to do in the near future. I think that they, again, also have very complex systems. Mm -hmm. I think that's certainly an easier, uh, just less friction yeah. for HR doing it that way. Yeah. I, I know the Bundeswehr is definitely not going to go to a cloud, which is the German <laughs> army, and they <laughs> modified that. <clears throat> out of the system. So <laughs> we're going to be in a one. I think they are not allowed to use any systems that actually work anyway, right? <laughs> At least. We completely agree with you there. Sorry? <laughs> My husband is an officer in the German You always hear about tanks and rifles <laughs> and anything that's not, not working. Uh, so always waiting for them to win the Peace Nobel Prize. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Very interesting point of view. Okay, my friend, I think at some point we'll have to wrap up. I think we do. We we, we could go on forever, this group. Yeah, I but, know, yeah. I know. But I think it would be nice for listen. all of us to have the time for a glass of water before getting on to the next <laughs> US yeah. version of, uh, of the whole thing. Thanks, everybody. It was for lovely so talking to all of you. you all Thanks again. a lot for organizing. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Sarah. And we'll talk later. Bye.